Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. About five o'clock, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all, all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us. Who have, been born, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So the parable of the vineyard is about grace and about the nature of God's kingdom. We will look at the theme of salvation inherent in this story, and then we will look at the parable in terms of how we function in Christian community. Let's consider a, the salvation example first. The workers in the vineyard who were paid at the end of the day, the same wages as those who worked all day, can symbolize those who make it to heaven having discovered faith late in their lives. We see this grace in the 11th hour in a 1939 film called Angels with Dirty Faces, based on the fictional story of the same name by Roland Brown. And it stars James Cagney and Pat O'Brien. Has anybody actually seen this film? Okay, there's a few moviegoers out there. <laughs> so James Cagney plays Rocky, and Pat O'Brien plays Jerry. Two boys from the Lower East Side go down different paths after attempting to break into a boxcar. Rocky, who is caught and sent to reform school, goes on to become a major criminal and gangster. And Jerry, who goes on to become a priest, involved in trying to save the youth from the area from becoming criminals. The local youth look up to Rocky and idolize and emulate him. Throughout the story, Jerry's campaign against racketeers and, a corrupt, and corrupt politicians put his life in danger, while Rocky commits many crimes and kills those plotting against him. That results in Rocky uh, being tried and sentenced to death. Jerry, friend to the end, persuades Rocky to redeem himself by pretending to be a coward on the way to the electric chair. I read that that scene was done for a full week many, many times till they got it right. Because in this way, he is sending a message to the youth that will hopefully keep them from following a life of crime. So James Cagney's character earned his salvation in the 11th hour, and the youth were now less likely to follow his path. From a standpoint of fairness, most of us would say, well, it's not fair when someone who lived the life of a gangster and someone who lived the good Christian life both walk into heaven together. But what the parable teaches us is that we should, what we should say is what wondrous love is this? 
because we also recognize that just as the vineyard owner had the right as owner to do as he wished with his business, so too we should not question how God chooses to administer grace, as is said in the gospel. We will learn from this parable that God's grace and mercy transcend all human ideas of fairness. And to those who snicker, well, then why should I bother to be good at all? They should remember that because someone like Rocky might make it to heaven, but his life was clearly no picnic. For those who live by the sword, die by the sword. And yet his final message may have transformed the youth in the story. So let's talk now about the parable in terms of Christian community. Let's take a look at the human population and consider all it takes to create the conditions where we can grow into an expectation of being sentient and spiritual human beings, good citizens, healthy and fulfilled and having compassion for others. And of course, every culture has a different idea of how to define self-actualization. But life is, in many ways, unfair. When it comes to where we are born and under what circumstances, our basic inborn abilities, and even in the different levels in which we experience suffering. So how do we, as a human race, navigate this situation without succumbing to envy and divisiveness, as did the vineyard workers who worked all day? God knows that we live in a world where, in one way or the other, we will all experience suffering, and it is hard to be a human being. And God is a loving God. God created us. God loves us. God wants the best for each of us. And therefore, there is a lot of mercy. So what is the point? The point is we need to recognize that when the workers of the vineyard grumble that those who worked for one hour got paid the same as those who worked the whole day, they are coming from an attitude of work and reward rather than of gift and gratitude. But this parable is not a story of economics. This is a story of mercy. Matthew Meyer Bolton of Harvard Divinity School explains, Strictly speaking, the early arrivers don't envy the late arrivers, since envy means wishing to possess something someone else has. Rather, what we have here is the opposite, wishing someone else didn't have something you've already received. Indeed, the early arrivers are neither envious nor obsessed with fairness. They are scornful. They've judged the late arrivers to be less worthy, and they resent the vineyard owner's action because it erases their expected hierarchy. Remember what they said. You have made them equal to us. The vineyard owner, however, is coming from another place. Bolton points out that the new Revised Standard Version translates his response as, are you envious? But the Greek is literally, is your eye evil? Jesus uses this term, evil eye, one other time in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, literally, if your eye is evil, your whole body will be filled with full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Thus, the problem with the early arrivers has to do with how they see, or rather how they fail to see, the world around them. Where they could and should see a we, they see an us and a them. Where they could and, see, where they could and should see friendship they see contempt. Where they could and should see and be grateful for a vineyard of God's grace, they see an arena of competition and a cause for resentment. In short, their eye is unhealthy. Their whole way of seeing the world is distorted and obscured. We are called in this parable to think and act like the vineyard owner, who symbolizes God, of course. Seeing God's awesome creation is as full of grace and acting accordingly takes profound trust and patience, insight, and imagination. It's just plain difficult. We need each other's help to do it, and God's help most of all. But when we do see in this way, the wounds of creation begin to heal little by little. For when we see each other not as rivals, but rather as fellow beneficiaries of God's merciful gifts, we can then focus on the work of building God's kingdom. The imagery is meant to point to the realm of God who is not defined by our limited imaginations, but is a God who keeps his promises and always surprises us with his wisdom and generosity of spirit. Amen.
I want you to stand as you are able, and together let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please join me in the prayers of the people. Jesus calls us to give up our lives for others, that we may have the faith to live as Jesus did. Let us pray for all in need by responding to each petition, saying, Send us your Spirit, O Lord. O gracious God, you have given up your very self to save the world, that we may be empowered to give up ourselves for one another. We pray. Send us your spirit, O Lord. You have made your people equal and free in the baptism of your Son, that we may live joyfully in this new, year, new way. We pray. Send us your spirit, O Lord. You call us to take up our cross and follow the way of Christ, that we and all your whole church may serve one another and live in obedience to your word, we pray. Send, Send us your spirit, O Lord. You show to us all the poor and the needy, all the homeless and the hungry, that we may lighten the load by taking it upon ourselves, we pray, send, send us your spirit, O Lord. You give us enough that we may share with the world around us. On this day, we pray for all our partners in mission, especially for Rise Against Hunger, whom we are supporting with our Thanksgiving basket this month, that we and all institutions of relief may be insistent in our care for others. We pray. Send us your spirit, O Lord. You give us every perfect gift. On this day, we give you thanks for your gifts, especially for this parish family, for all of our visitors and newcomers, and for our altar flowers, which are given by the Flower Ministry of Grace that we may always remember your abundant blessings, we pray. Send us your spirit, O Lord. You show us how to care and love and, for those who, and have love for those who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or any kind of trouble. On this day, we pray especially for Lynn Lubinsky, Constance and Mark West, Michael Dunaway, Thea, Foster Ryan, 
presiding Bishop Michael Curry, the Reverend Bill Taylor and family, Erin Sheeda, Valerin Fagan, Joyce Kitcho, John Skelton, Sarah Manry, Sharon Milburns, Michael Cardwell, Ron and Lois Graham, Kenita Carter, Tammy Harriston, Chris Gallagher, and those we name at this time. That we may always know your healing power, we pray. Send, Send us, us your spirit, O Lord. You have surrounded us with saints of every time and place. On this day, we play, pray for those who have gone before us, especially Adriona Brooks West, Bryce Taylor, Jim Bostanchik, Neil Sugarmeyer, Kathy Melvin, Diana Hoops, Anne Engel, Joyce Kitjo, and those we name at this time. That we may follow them as they followed Christ on the way to the cross, we pray. Send Amen. us your spirit, O Lord. Hear our prayers, O merciful God, and accept our praises. May the gospel of your cross give its miraculous life to all the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. I invite you to stand if you are able. My sisters, my brothers, my friends in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. 